use a real small hymnal this morning. We're going to turn to page six. Because God's been good. 
And uh, we uh, because he lived, I can faith. Come on. Right.
And uh, all night I was thinking, boy, when I heard about Sister Tulip. He said, Took Sister Tulip, that song you always sung, I'm blessed. I am blessed. And all that time I seen her singing, oh, I tell you, she don't remember, she don't remind me about Rilletta Lynn or Dolly Parton. And I love those country songs. My wife, she's from the hills, Kentucky. And I'm from Trevor City. So we made a good pair when we got married. And uh, I love a Michael. I love my wife very much, but Jesus comes first. Right? And I thank the Lord that He has given us the opportunity to come, even though it's cold out here. It's warm in here. And the man of God that we have here today, I'm sure that Sister Tulip heard once in a great while or all the time. And she probably was at home reading the word of God by herself and her three little critters she had or something. But she wasn't by herself. The Lord was with her at all times. Amen. And some of the scriptures I believe that she had heard from God's word. Even though I walk through the shadow of death, I will not Fear no evil. Yeah. Why? Because the shepherd was with her all the time. And when a shepherd is taking care of a hundred sheep and one strays away, the shepherd said, No, I'm not going to go look for her. She wants to come back. She can come back on her own. But see, that's not the way it works. He goes and looks for that sheep, and there it is. Yep. Because he wants a hundred percent of his people, not ninety-nine. And that's what he had with those sheep, ninety-nine. But thank God that he went out and looked for that sheep, and he found her. And I thank God that we got a living God that learns and, and teaches us every day. I used to go to the men's fellowship for Bible study, and that's all they done. Talk about the word of the Lord. Nothing else. But thank God that what we're learning today, you know, not even reading it, but hearing it, we can share it in our heart. Why? Because one of these days, the way the way this country is running, you know, fighting here and there, I, I fighting here and there. We need to have some scriptures inside of us to learn. And when somebody tells us, you know, what did you learn today in church? Oh, we can tell you. The preacher looks good up in the pulpit. No, no, no. But the word of God is going to be brought forward today, you know. That's why I'm here today to learn something that I didn't know. But thank God that we can sing, sing, and, and, and praise God for all that He's done. And uh, and I just praise God for this day. Oh, I was going to read this here before I forget. And my wife said, don't forget your glasses. <laughs> so if I mess up, you guys, excuse me. Be strong in the word of God. And do not give up. That means, hold on. For your works will be rewarded one of these days. Since Tulip already have gone through the pearly gates, I believe with all my heart and receive her rewards. Amen. And you might ask me how you know there's rewards in God's heaven. Read the book. Read the book. 
Man. I had a uh, a son that was going to college, and that that her her day used to work with me, and he had, he needed one more subject to finish the college, the degree that he wanted to be on. But see, he didn't study the work, he didn't study those books because his dad was a professor, his grandfather was a professor in that college. And his grandmother was up here notch, knowing all the college rules and everything. And when, his, when the professor began to share the, 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 the books and the test re, the results on the tests, he fell 100%. And the young man went to the professor and said, why is it that I had a low rate and didn't pass? And the professor looked at him right in the eyes. He said, didn't you study the book? No. Why not? Because my dad, my grandfather, he's a professor. And my grandmother, she's top notch. He said, well, that's why you got low average. You did not read the book. So there's going to come a day when they're going to take our Bibles. We were watching a movie the other day where they were hiding and having prayer meetings. Why do you have to hide when you have a prayer when you got to go prayer meeting? Oh, I believe I believe when I was so happy when we used to come here on Saturdays and and have a little prayer and little testimonies. I mean that's food for my my soul. And I thank God for the men of God that we have here today because they if we don't know something, go to them and ask them. And they'll say, well, let's sit down and read the let's open the book. See, me and I, me and my wife were using the Bible for a romance. You ever heard that little song? I'm using my Bible for a romance. And uh, I'm so glad that. The roadmap is still open. You know? Just ask anybody about that book, and they'll tell you. We love him.
Christ is our Lord. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. 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 Thankful to the Lord for another, another day, for his many blessings, for all that he has done for me and my family. And uh, I will go back and turn this down as soon as we, when we go to the opening prayer. Because uh, I can tell it's I, I can tell it's loud, I'm being told it's loud. <laughs> and so I'll take care of that. But let us stand and go to the Lord in prayer once again, thanking him for his many, many blessings. I'm going to ask my dad if he would lead us in that prayer. Heavenly Father, God, once again, we thank you for being here today. And Father, for what we've heard already and enjoyed. Father, knowing that there's more coming. Father, we just pray that the Holy Spirit of God would just have its way. 
that each one of us should just open up our hearts and our minds uh, to the service of God and let the Spirit just work in each one. Because I know there's a blessing here for every one of us today. If we don't get it, it's not your fault. I just pray God that we just reach out, lay hold on the precious Word of God and just apply it to our lives. Thanking you, God, for all the blessings that you bless the people here with. God, for them that had surgery, them that lost loved ones, them that are sick, whatever that need is, God, we thank you for the blessings that you've already blessed and that you're going to continue. Now, Father, bless the word of God. Use God to your glory that we can be lifted up, strengthened today in spirit, God. We can be better witnesses for you. And Father, we just pray that that's what we'll do. When we leave here today, uh, coming across someone today, God, you'll share us with Jesus. Father, thank you for everything because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 This morning we're going to be in a few different places. Is that better for the mic? Good. Okay. Yeah, brother wouldn't come to me last week and he said, you're going to have to run the system in the back. I said, no problem. <laughs> but I'm thankful for all that the brother does when he's here. And, uh, but this morning we're going to be in three different places. The first place we're going to be is John chapter 15 and verse 13. <clears throat> the second place is John 3, 16. And the third place is John 14, 1 through 3. And I know all of you know these verses probably by heart. But you won't need to read for the, or stand for the reading of God's word today. But Because we're going to touch on these verses very quickly. And they all have a common theme. John 15, 13 says, Hath no man greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. You all know what John 3, 16 says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And John 14, 1 through 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. In all of those scriptures this morning there's a common theme and it's the love of Jesus Christ you know we say to each other hey I love you when we come into the church house every week I love you it's good to see you but the truth is there's probably not anyone we'd be willing to lay our life down for to die on an old rugged cross but Jesus Christ did just that because he loved us. Amen. Guys, there's no excuse not to love others. Because see, Jesus Christ loved us before we cared about him. So for any of us to say at any given time, well, I'm not going to pray for that person. I'm not going to love that person. Do you see what kind of sin they're living in? Well, did we realize what sin we were living in when Jesus Christ loved us? Yeah. See, I didn't care about Jesus Christ, but yet he cared about me. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hath no man greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. I'm thankful for the day that Jesus Christ laid down his life for me. Amen. You know, I heard a, a preacher say a while back that it's hard to get people excited when they come to church. And boy, isn't that the truth. It's hard to get excited because we're focused on so many other things. What did I leave in the oven at home? <laughs> Where are we going to go eat after church? I wonder if the chicken's going to be as bad this week as it was last week. Except for Sister Lorraine. You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> you know, I didn't get too good a service last week. Boy, you know... This is going on in my life, and that's going on in my life, and these things are bothering me. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to make it through next week. 
financially or maybe how I'm going to get through next week health-wise. There's a lot of things that may cross our mind. And so when we come to church, we try to fit God somewhere down on the list. And it doesn't work that way. Because we were a friend of Jesus Christ when we didn't even care about who he was and the fact that he gave his life on an old rugged cross for an old sinner like me and an old sinner like you. And the fact that when we came to him, he didn't turn us away and one day he's coming back for us to take us to that place called heaven ought to be enough when we come to church to get us excited. Yeah. But there are five points that I want us to uh, focus on this morning. And I'm going to read you a few things from Holding Forth, The Word of Life. It's a book that uh, I've read many times in the devotion. But I want to touch on a few things. On the title of today's message is, What a Day That Will Be. Amen. It says in many places throughout the Bible, the writers have used an expression that referred to as the, that day or the day of the Lord or the greatest day. For example, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 1.12, For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The Apostle Peter adds, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The Apostle John further states in Revelation 6.17, For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? The point I want us to focus on first of what a day that will be is sin is abolished. I want you to think about that for just a second this morning. No matter how good you felt when you got up this morning, sin was still here. You still had to deal with maybe the issues of this life or the pain that you've had to endure and maybe your own body. No matter how nice the sun was shining, no matter the positives of the day, you're still going to have to deal with sin. But there's coming a day that you won't have to anymore. Amen. My Aunt Trula no longer has to worry about those things. You know, when we got the news that she had passed away, it bothered me. But then I thought, you know what? She's better off than we are. I'm going to miss her with all my heart. But she's better. She's okay. I wouldn't wish her back here even if God gave me the opportunity to do that. Because that which she has worked and toiled for in this life has come to pass. Church, we ought to be looking forward to that day. Because what a day that will be. I can't wait for that day. I love this life and I love those that God has blessed me with. But I'm looking forward to see Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm looking forward to the day that the devil can't knock on your door, that the devil can't throw things in your path, that the devil can't cause strife and persecution and difficulty and troubles and trials in your life and in my life. I'm looking forward to that day. What? That Jesus has promised me. But sin will be abolished. Today, the world faces many problems. World leaders are deeply concerned about the problems of energy, inflation, unemployment, crime, and terrorism. However, the world's biggest problem is a sin problem. Did you hear what that said? It's a sin problem. You know, we're quick to label somebody. We're quick to say, well, you know, it's all their fault. They're not doing anything. No, it's a sin's fault. But thank God there's a remedy for the worldwide problem and it's found in the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, I thought about this last night. You know, we say a lot as, as church people and a lot as Christians that the world just doesn't care about Jesus Christ. Well, they never did. But the biggest problem is the church doesn't care much about him either. Yeah. He's a second thought or a last thought or not even a thought at all. And does anybody see a problem with that? 
See, when Jesus Christ becomes not as important to you as he used to be, then you can't act surprised when he doesn't show up like he used to. See, I can't say, well, you know, I don't understand why God's not blessing me if I haven't read his word. I can't understand why God's not intervening in my situations. I can't understand why God's not answering my prayers when you're not in his word. You know why I get excited about Jesus Christ? And you know why I know the prayer works? Because God has shown up in my life. Things have happened that I did not think would ever happen again. Blessings that I had hoped for. <coughs> that God brought back. He not only brought it back. He brought it back better than it ever was before. So we can sit in our church pew and say, well, you know, I don't know if God still answers prayer. I don't know if God still cares about my life. I don't know if God can really answer this or answer that. Well, I'm here to tell you, he absolutely can. And if you'll trust him, you'll wait upon him. You'll believe in him. You won't doubt it. You'll, you'll be excited when it comes. Then things will happen because God understands that, you know what? That person is willing to do whatever it takes. And I'm willing to give them what they desire. There's nothing too messed up that God can't fix. The problem is we've stopped asking. We've allowed sin to get us so sidetracked that we don't even look to God anymore. Well, you can't help my problem, preacher. You don't understand. No, I may not understand your problem, but I understand who Jesus Christ is. And behind me on the wall in Luke chapter 1 and verse 37 it says, For nothing shall be impossible with God. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Number two, wars will be ended. I don't know if any of you watch the news. I care not to watch it anymore. I haven't watched the news in probably over a couple of years. Because it's always bad news, if any kind of news at all. But wars will be ended when that day comes, but until then, we're dealing with issues now with them talking of war. But Jesus Christ said in the last days, there will be wars and rumors of wars. Guys, if we read God's word, there's no reason to be surprised. God's word's already told us it's going to get worse before it gets better. Amen. Mm -hmm. But somehow along the way, Christians have thought that somehow it was going to get better. I'm not going to have to deal with all these problems. I don't know what Bible you're reading, but it's not the same one that I read. God's word says it's going to get rough. It's going to get tough. It's going to get hard. They're going to not like you for you serving Jesus Christ. They're not going to like you because you read God's word. They're not going to like you because you stand up for what you believe in. They're not going to like you because you carry around the Bible. They're not going to like you because you have an active prayer life. You want to find out what people think about you being a Christian? Sit down in a restaurant when you leave here this afternoon and bow your head and close your eyes and thank God for the food that's in the plate in front of you and you're going to find out real quick how many people snicker at what you're doing because they think what you're doing is a joke. The world doesn't care about what you feel, what you think, what you hope for, what you desire. But Jesus Christ does. And God, I want you to understand something. No matter how hard it gets, and it will get a lot harder than it already is. No matter what happens in this life, do not turn your back on God. You stay faithful to him. If they come to you and say, you need to, you're, I'm going to take your life if you don't deny Jesus Christ. You say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for me. Don't you turn your back on God. I'll tell you right, right now, church, that God's been too good to me. And too many times I've overlooked him. I've thought that I could do something better without him. God's been good to me in my life. And I'll never turn my back on Jesus Christ. Don't you do it, church. Don't you let the devil tell you that. 
God doesn't care about you. Look at all the problems you're going through. Look at the world around you. God doesn't care about you. And I know this morning all of you have probably heard that at one time or another. That God doesn't care about you. You've done too much wrong. Look at the state of the issues of your life. Look at the state of the issues of this nation. We're starting to step off into the third year of the pandemic. And I'm pretty sure if you're, any of you are like me that you were done with this a long time ago. But it doesn't change the fact that we're still knee deep in a situation. And we can sit around and we can beg her about it. We can argue about it. We can point fingers at where we think it happened and who we think is the blame. But the problem is, guys, we're all in this together. And the sooner we realize that, the better off we're going to be. And the sooner we realize that our strength comes from Jesus Christ and no one else. You can trust in the scientists all you want to. God gave them some knowledge. You can trust in the doctors all you want to. God gave them some knowledge. And they do a wonderful job with the job that they do. Trying their best to protect people each and every day. But I'll tell you right now, our strength comes from Jesus Christ. And if we learn to focus on him, learn to look to it, then these wars and these rumors of wars and the issues that we face on a daily basis will make it through it just fine. Amen. Number three, now I want you to listen to this one. Is Satan is conquered. Right now, Satan does what he wants to told you a couple weeks ago that hell is patient. You know, we may not want to accept this, but Satan is sitting in the church pews today that are empty. He's looking what he can poke and what he can jab at and what he can cause an issue and where he can get people upset and angry with God and angry with one another and cause all kinds of problems. And you say, oh, I wouldn't do that. He has done that. But Satan one day will be conquered. And I'm thanking the Lord for that. Yes. Sorrow subdued is number four. And number five is death destroyed. Now these two go together. We sing a song here, and we have many times, you've probably heard it. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day, that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear. No more sickness, no pain. No more parting over there. Now listen to this. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day, that will be. Church, this morning, if you want one reason to be excited in Jesus Christ, I'm going to give it to you. What a day that will be when we get to see Jesus Christ. I'm looking forward to that day, Brother Ralph. I'm looking forward to that day that I hear Enter in, thou good and faithful servant, to the joys of the Lord. It doesn't mean that my life was perfect. doesn't mean that everything went the way I planned it to go. doesn't mean I always made the right choices. doesn't mean I always made everybody feel love and, 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 and acceptance and commitment. But what it does mean is that even an old sinner like me, and I, even an old sinner like me, can say, oh, Lord, please forgive me for those I've let down. Lord, please forgive me for the times that I hurt people. Please forgive me for the times that I wasn't a Christian like I should have been. Please forgive me the times that I took the cross at Calvary for granted. Please forgive me of the times that I sinned against you and knew better but chose to do it anyway. Guys, it doesn't matter if you carry a Christian title. It doesn't matter if you're a preacher. It doesn't matter if you're a deacon. Doesn't matter if you're a trustee or the best church member to ever sit your backside in a church pew. You will let God down more than once in your life. And because of a loving, merciful Savior, I can stand here today and say, Oh, God's been good to me. Church, let me tell you something. We should be excited that one day we're going to see Jesus Christ. 
And I looked upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. Let me tell you something. I'm nobody special. You can dress me up. You can clean me up. And you can make me look like the world says, wow, that's a, that's a, he looks like he's a pretty important dude. But let me tell you something. I'm nothing without Jesus Christ. You can put a necktie on sin and still sin. You can polish up whatever you want to polish up. Guess what? Underneath, it's still worthless. When Jesus found me, I didn't have nothing to offer him. Not a thing. Nothing. Amen. But he loved me. Amen. He said, he may not have anything now, but I'm going to make him into something. Yeah. I preach the word of Jesus Christ with passion and excitement because I know what Jesus Christ did for me. I know what he continues to still do for me. I know that every day of my life I let him down and yet he's still there when I come to him in prayer and say, Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me, Lord, for all the times that I've failed you. Please forgive me for all the times that I've let you down. The second verse of that song that I read you is the greatest verse, in my opinion, weirdly ever written. There'll be no sorrow there. I'm looking forward to that day. There'll be no burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. You know, we've had to say goodbye to a lot of people over the years. Many of which were ready to meet Jesus Christ. I'm looking forward to a place that I can go that there's not going to be any more hospitals, nursing homes, cancer wards. As we've said many times, no COVID. Funeral homes will be out of business. We're not going to have to stand in the graveside of someone we love with all of our heart and say goodbye to them. Because Jesus Christ promised that. I'll preach if you believe that with all my heart. Yeah. You know, I'm just crazy enough to take God at his word. I'm crazy enough that when Jesus Christ said that whosoever shall call off the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, there's some people that call themselves ministers and don't believe that. They believe God has to choose you, which says he picks and chooses who he decides he's going to save. Let me tell you something. That's not how the cross works. That's not how the blood of Jesus Christ works. Let me tell you something, everybody that walks in a pair of shoes will get a visit from the Holy Spirit of God. What you do with it is up to you. What you do with that convicting power of the Holy Spirit is your choice. But God never excludes anybody from the saving power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because if he did, then they died and gone to hell. That means that they weren't given the same opportunity as I was. The same opportunity that you were. And that means that somehow we were better than they were. And that's not how salvation works. And so if you're a preacher watching this video. And there is some that share on my page. And I've got to pick and choose which ones I allow to go through or not. Because biblically I don't agree with them. But if you're watching this video and your eternal security. And God only chooses who's he, who he will say. You are wrong. And need to get into God's word a little more than you have been, brother. And I'll be praying for you. Because that gives people the wrong idea. That makes people believe, well, maybe God can't save me. Jesus Christ in his word said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. And I'm just crazy enough to believe whosoever means whosoever. Because that's what God said. I'm tired of people leading people astray because they want to kind of switch it up a little bit. God's word did say that he knew me and he chose me. I'll give him that. But God does not look at one person and say, I'll save you and look at another and say, I won't save you. That's not the God I serve. God doesn't work like that. And if you believe he does, then you've got a wrong understanding of who God is. Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be 
saved. Amen. Amen. I want people to know that no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've committed, no matter who you think you are or how far gone you believe you are, that Jesus Christ can and will save you if you'll call out to him. My sister asked me the other day, she said there was a preacher she'd seen online that said he doesn't believe in a, uh, a sinner's prayer. Well, I agree with him. I don't either because the sinner's prayer isn't in God's word. Sinner's prayer is a cookie cutter version of what somebody tells you you should pray in order to get saved by God. And you can recite that prayer all you want to just because that's what somebody else told you to do and you'll get up from the altar as lost as you were when you knelt down to it because God's not interested in a cookie cutter prayer. God's interested in a heart that's broken knowing that they need a savior and nobody can pray that prayer but you. Nobody can lay those words out to God but you. And when you're broken, somebody else telling you what to say isn't going to work because it's not coming from here. It's coming from here. And you'll never get saved by lip service. You'll only get saved by a heart that knows it's in need of Jesus Christ. So no, I don't believe in a sinner's prayer. I don't believe that you come up to an altar and kneel down and recite some words the preacher told you to say and then all of a sudden magically think you got saved. God doesn't work that way. You either come up here because God convicted you to get here. You pour yourself out, as my dad has said many times, like water, that you need a Savior and you're on your way to hell without him or you will never get saved. God's not interested in your mouth. He's interested in your heart. And you'll get it right or you'll get it wrong. Yeah. That's it. So I agree with people that say, I don't believe in the sinner's prayer because I don't need it. What I do believe in is a sinner knowing they need Jesus Christ. Getting on their face before him and pouring themselves out saying, God, please forgive me. Save me because I'm lost. I don't want anybody going through this life thinking they did what they needed to do to get right with God and then only to find out that they didn't. I believe our responsibility as preachers is to tell people the truth. And I'm thankful for the, my entire life that my dad has always told the truth. Why? Because we want to see this day come what a day that will be for absolutely everyone. I know that's not possible. Not everybody's going to heaven. That's just the truth of the situation. Not everyone's going to hear enter in thy good and faithful servant in the joys of the Lord. Not everyone's going to be prepared to meet Jesus Christ. You say, well, that sounds kind of rough. Well, it's true. In today's world, everybody that leaves this world is, oh, they're gone to a better place. Well, I sure hope they are. But if they never made a personal decision for Jesus Christ, they haven't gone on to a better place. You get preachers that tell you to live your best life now. I don't want to live my best life now. If that means I'm living the best life I can now, I'm on my way to hell if that's all I've got. My best life comes when I see Jesus face to face. My best life comes when I get to enter that place called heaven. Yep. Right now, I'm just a pilgrim traveling through this old world of love. Guys, let me tell you something. <clears throat> Being a Christian is not a joke. Being a Christian isn't just something we crazy Christians do because it's Sunday. You know, well, it goes in a crazy Christian's church again. That's all they ever do. If church ever becomes just something you do, then you need to have a talk with God. Boy, I got to get to church to see what so-and-so's wearing. I got to get to church to see, you know, this or to see that or to find out and catch up and everything else. Look, I don't come to church to do those things. I come to church to lift up the name of the Lord and to be thankful for all that God has given me. Now don't get me wrong. I love to see each and every one of you. And your smiling faces and your I love yous and welcome to church. I love that. 
But that's not why I come out here. I come out here to see the, to see the Lord and to lift up the name of Jesus and be thankful for what he's given me. If church ever becomes just because it's a habit, then I need to get things right with God. You know, there's some churches in town. I'll say this and we'll close. They do all that they can to attract the world. And in the process, the message of God gets cloudy. And I understand to a point they're trying to do something that excites the world enough to bring them into the church. But the problem is Jesus Christ is enough. We don't need all this other worldly stuff to try to attract people. We need to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. We need to show them that Jesus is enough. Yes. And I think it's great when churches have events, but when the events begin to supersede the message of Jesus Christ and the gospel, then we've got a problem. Well, we've got to attract younger people. We've got to attract the younger generation. Let me tell you what attracts people. Because beyond popular belief, I'm not as old as you think I am. I still kind of know what young people like to do. I know it got real quiet in here. <laughs> you know what people like? People who are authentic. People who don't try to be something they're not. You know what I mean? They want somebody that tells them the truth. They want somebody that's excited about what they believe. How many people you think would go to a Detroit Tigers game if you walked into Comerica Park and there was 40,000 sleeping people? Do you think the person coming through the gate go, wow, why I'm here, dude? Look at all this excitement. Boy, it was a good day at the ballpark. Or funeral home. I wasn't real sure which one I was in. Nobody get excited. They go, I'm going to stay here. I'm going home. I paid $75 a ticket for this. But that's what happens, man. When somebody meets somebody that's a Christian, you thank them to be a Christian. Yeah. It's going to be in the house of the Lord today. Really? Did you tell your face? You gotta get excited. God's done something for us. Yeah. If we're here this morning, bought with the blood of Jesus, don't be excited. Say, wow, man, I'm thankful to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to be at church. I love it when Brother Mike goes, it's good to be in church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Why? Because they get excited. They're happy. They're thankful. That's what Christians do. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. We come into church, got to be reverent and quiet and sit down real, you know, Christian-like. <laughs> really? We can be reverent by thanking God for what he's given us. We can be reverent by getting excited. Two places in God's word that makes that very clear. Number one, when Jesus Christ said, if you don't praise me, I'll cause the rocks to cry out. Yep. And number two, I believe it was, was it Ezekiel in the valley? Ezekiel in the valley of dry bones. God told him to go down and preach. That's what he did. He did what God told him to do. He got excited. He got, he got involved. He went down to that valley of dry bones with one thing on his mind, and that was doing exactly what God asked him to do. How many of us would go to a graveyard somewhere and start preaching? Well, Lord, what you bring me out here for? There ain't nothing out here. <clears throat> Guys, it's time to get excited in Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's time to get happy. It's time that amazing grace, just a little talk with Jesus, what a day that will be. I'll fly away and the old rugged cross becomes songs that matter to our heart. Not just things we sing. It's time that God's word becomes alive in our heart. Not just something we read. It's time that prayer comes alive in our heart. 
not just something we say. And it's time that worship becomes alive in our heart and not just somewhere we know. It's time that Christians be Christians. It's time that we back each other up, lift each other up, build each other up, get excited with one another and say, God's been good to me. Has God been good to you? And if you say, yes, he has, say, praise the Lord. God's been good to two people. How about three? How about four? How about a church full? You want, you know why we don't have people sitting in the church pews this morning? It's because we're at the point where we're like, no, we're happy just with the size and the number we got. I'm not happy with the number we got. Why? Because as long as this place is still spinning, there's lost people in need of Jesus Christ. And we get comfortable all we want to. But the truth is, I want to see this church house full. Not because of numbers, but because of souls. In need of the Lord. Yep. Amen. Jesus Christ said, Go ye to all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He didn't say, Go ye to all the world, preach the gospel, and put as many people in your church until you're comfortable with that number, and then you can stop. That's not what he said. Let's share the gospel. Yes. Let's get excited. And let's look forward to what a day that will be when my Jesus. I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, a glorious day that will be. Amen. The altar is open. The question I want to ask you this morning is this. How important is that day to you? I know all of us have somebody that if the Lord came back today, they wouldn't be ready to meet him. I know that all of us have family that if Jesus Christ came back today, they wouldn't be ready to meet him. I know that I do. You know that I heard one time from a preacher, the only prayer that never gets answered is the one that's never spoken. You say, oh, I believe God can do all things. But yet we won't ask him. God said he won't withhold any good thing from you and I. But what I'm asking this morning is, are we willing to say, Lord, I need something from you. I need an answer to prayer. And I know only you can help me. I can't do it alone. I've tried. Guys, again this morning, I know God answers prayer because he's answered mine. And on more than one occasion, he has shown up in my life when I know it was only God. I told you at the beginning of this service that he'll not only make things new, he'll make them better than they were before. But you've got to trust him. You've got to say, Lord, in your time and in your way, I'm trusting you. Now it's true, you can pray right where you are. But as Brother Ralph has said, myself has said, my dad has too. When we step out in faith, we show God that we're taking it seriously. God, I don't care who's looking. God, I don't care who's watching. God, I don't care what somebody else says. I'm in need of something, and I'm coming to get it. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. let us stand.